The Metropolitan, seeing me, ushered me to himself, and he said, it is you did it, you know, it is you did. So I approached very sort of, very, very not knowing what, what is going to be this huge man and so on. And he then started stroking my hair very, very gently and looking at me. And he said, Nebisha Detino, Nebisha Detino. And you know, this is something that till the end of my days, I remember these words. And he said afterwards that, you know, no, no harm will come to you here. Do not be afraid. Nothing, nothing bad will happen to you here. You are safe. The time in the monastery was just a paradise for us because we came from ghetto that uh, we were short of uh, food. We were very much uh, scared because of the German uh, occupation. The Monastery was um, uh, self-sufficient as a farming community, which was one of the fortunate things, because being self-sufficient, it um, provided food. And until late in 43, when the Germans took away much of the cattle and much of the equipment, uh, we really did not have problems as far as hunger is concerned. Amidst the incessant turmoil and unbearable human suffering of the Second World War in Eastern Europe, the residence of Metropolitan Archbishop Andrei Count Sheptitsky at Sobor Hoyura in Lviv remained an island of peace and refuge for all who called. I am no historian, nor am I an academician. But I am a witness to history, at least to some events in it, and I have, and I'm speaking to you here today for one and one reason only: to pay respect, reverence, and homage to a great man, His Holiness the Archbishop Metropolitan Andrei Count Sheptitsky. It was the fall of 1942. I don't know whether it was September or October, but it was definitely the fall of 1942. And at the time I lived in a small village known in Polish as Szczerzyc and Ukrainian as Szczerzyc, where my paternal grandparents lived. And my father had arranged, was lucky enough to be, have arranged to have me hidden in the monastery with, uh, by Metropolitan Sheptitsky. I had several minutes only with Archihegmon Sheptitsky. Uh, I remember my uncle brought me to his uh, palace on the Yasna Gura and uh, he put his hand on my head and uh, sent me, asked uh, somebody to take me to one of the priests in, uh, who lived in a village to teach me the language the prayers, the behavior of Ukrainians. And this was the last time I saw Sheptitsky and I saw my uncle. And uh, this is the, how I was saved. And he spoke to my mother and my mother told him he asked her, 
questions, obviously, and she said, yes, I'm, this is, we are the two of us now left alive, and the rest, my husband, the child of six, uh, who you see on the photograph there, my parents, everybody's been murdered, killed, all sorts. And the entire family, sort of further family, you know. And I'm the only one left with, with Lily here. And he said, and, sh and he, listening to her, sort of tears started going down his cheeks. I remember that because I looked at him and he was silent. He just listened and then tears were going down his cheeks. And then he said, he gave instructions to whoever was there, a monk or, or a priest, that never, never will you separate the mother and this child. They have to be together. The process of integrating children of various cultures, making Jewish children inconspicuous to the ever-searching Gestapo, required discretion and understanding. So I was left in this new world, which I somehow instinctively, I don't remember my own feelings at the time. I'm sure they were very confused but I instinctively felt that I had to adapt to, and that my life depended on adapting to this new world. I had to, at the age of seven, I spoke German, which was my native language, and Polish, which my nanny taught me. But now I had to learn Ukrainian. I had to learn the rudiments of those prayers that a seven-year-old would know. Ojcze nasz, divo. I had to learn how to read a little bit in Tsarkovnu so that I could follow the prayers in the prayer book. I had to learn how to cross myself and all of the other things that a seven-year-old would normally living in that culture know so that I could pass. Daniel Timchina was the head of our orphanage and he was very careful not to show others that we are Jewish. So we are taking baths, either two of us, two of the children, Jewish children, or the third one was bathing with him, not to show our identity. For a seven-year-old, that's a major thing to accomplish. And I know that every time my children, but particularly my grandchildren, reach the age of seven, I would look at them and I would marvel. That I could accomplish that. The Metropolitan used his many personal connections and the wide network of his church in support of this integration and concealment process. We were sent to Ubot, where Matei Humeni was, was the, the, the mother superior, and she took my mother in to her residence. She, she was separate from the actual convent and the orphanage, a little house separately, but, but within, within two steps from each other. And she took my mother, but she said also, don't be afraid, your mother is here and you are here, you are not going to be separated, which was quite wonderful, quite wonderful. Here are some of the documents that the Gestapo was looking for me. And gradually uh, I got used to the, to the work schedule. Uh, we went to a school which was uh, run by a schoolmaster. His name was Duke. Unbeknownst to us, there was a, another five-year-old child with his mother and aunt hidden in the attic of Duke's house. That boy I eventually became 
Roald Hoffman, who was the Nobel Prize winner in chemistry and professor of chemistry at Cornell, also a well-recognized poet. Uh, and he was hidden in that, um, in that attic, which we didn't know about. This is a picture of Rabbi Kahane, who was, was saved with his family in the monastery of Sheptitsky. And after the war became the chief rabbi of the Polish army. And later he became chief rabbi here in Israel of the Air Force. And later chief rabbi of the Argentina. There were two other Jewish boys uh, in Univ at the time, uh, Oded, and uh, whose name was Dorco, and Daniel, who was Adam Daniel Rothfeld. And this is a photograph in front of the church with um, Rat Daniel uh, Timchina, and here I am, sullen looking in the back. And this is Oded, Odorko, and this is Daniel. Uh, this is a picture of um, Daniel, I call him Daniel, he's known as Adam Daniel uh, Rothfeld. Uh, this is a photograph that he sent me some years later when he uh, met with the Pope. Um, and he indicated in his letter that he spoke about me with the Pope and the Pope sent his blessings and, and that he thanked in our name uh, the church for doing what it did. The Metropolitan's relationship with the spiritual leaders of the Jewish community was not last-minute charity in the face of looming death, but a long-standing personal, professional, and intellectual friendship. Archihegmon Sheptitsky promised Rabbi David Kahane that he will give back, give him back all the children and that he saved during the war. And uh, they took me from Uniev to Lvov. And uh, in Lvov came somebody from da uh, Rabbi David Kahana took me to his flat and later to somebody else's apartment. And from there, they sent me to Palestine, to my parents who were waiting for me. So this, uh, this blanket uh, was, I think, probably the official blanket of the Univ Monastery. <laughs> And I covered myself with it throughout the uh, horrible winters of uh, Ukraine and um, used it all through 1942 and 43, and part of 44, and then carried it with me from Ukraine to Poland and from Poland to England and from England to the United States. And here we are. <laughs> And I might add that it was also the blanket we very proudly used when my grandson had his circumcision. Because I am here in Israel, I was the one who put the appeal to Yad Vashem in the names of all the others. I am the representative of all these children who saved, were saved by Sheptitsky. He was exposed. He was a most courageous man. He was, first of all, he, his humanity was such. He was almost a saint, a sanctity about this man. Plus, he, he endangered himself. He endangered he, the entire, um, the entire um, church, if you like, who 
kept us because it was at his recommendation. So he is the head of it all. And he, in his own, in his own library, he kept a rabbi, Rabbi Dr. Kahane, behind the wall, behind the books. And when they talk about collaboration or cooperation with the Germans, I mean, what sort of a thing is that if the Gestapo visited him sometimes once a week, sometimes once a fortnight, and, and you know, for inspection, to see, to they, they looked around. For what? For whom? For the Jews, of course. Today, there are over 2,000 Ukrainians recognized by Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Martyrs and Heroes Remembrance Authority, as righteous among the nations for their personal involvement in sheltering Jews during the Second World War. The title of Righteous Among the Nations has been granted by Yad Vashem to Studite brother Danilo Temchina, Sister Josefa Olana Viter, and to the Metropolitan's brother, Blessed Clementi Sheptitsky. The gentleman Sheptitsky, Clement, got the honor uh, as Reicher uh, in 1995. Yad Vashem should award for saving lives. That is, their, that is their premise, that is their emblem. Whosoever saves one life saves the world entire. They should not be political. They, sh they, sh they should be like they were to begin with a humanitarian organization. They award those wonderful, amazing, courageous heroes of the war. To me, heroes of the war who didn't fight with weapons, they fought with their hearts. I hope that the people in Jerusalem, in Yad Vashem, will come sooner or to the conclusion, to the decision to give him the honor that he deserves very much. An Italian journalist was doing an interview with him, with the judge Beisky, and at one given moment he asked him a question, something like, is there anything you regret in your life? Or, you know, like, you, what is the, the nicest thing you remember? What is it? And he said, yes, I believe I made a mistake in the Sheptitsky case. And I have that, I have it among all the papers. That's what he said. I believe I made a mistake in the Sheptitsky case. And he died a few months later. So, so chances are that Yad Vashem maybe doesn't want to admit a mistake, who knows? But that's what he said, and that's in writing. This I have the name of the journalist, everything. Interesting, isn't it? Until now, I don't have the response on my request. They delay the decision more and more because they look for another reasons. Metropolitan Sheptitsky is the only head of church, the only one who during that time, during the darkest hours in history, had the courage to oppose the regime to oppose the, the, the fact, I mean, who was writing letters to Himmler and to Hitler and to Wechter, who? But he, no other head of state, and that includes the Pope very much so. The letters were not answered. The Pope never answered the plea which, which uh, Metropolitan sent to him in his second letter, telling him what is happening, murder, so please help, nothing, not an answer, nothing. And no other head of state did what he did. He actually was, had the courage to, to, to write to the pastoral letters. I mean, he couldn't stand there and talk, but 
he wrote and he, he his pastoral letters to and asked his people not to not to be not to be involved in murders and asked Himmler not to involve his people in in his in these murders. I mean who else did that? Nobody. No other head of state of um, of church. No other head of church. I owe my life to him. So obviously I am totally biased in his favor. Apart from anything else, this man, this wonderful man, the Metropolitan, should really, really be never forgotten. He should be remembered, but as I say, maybe by, by doing an annual award to a history, to some very, very inspirational history teacher who will teach these children the right things so that this world is better because the world is not very good now. And then that award should be in his name because this is how he would have wanted it to be, a good world. Or maybe a scholarship to a student, to someone who can't afford but would like to study. I think this is how you can commemorate a man to, you know, to, to in perpetuity, to, 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 leave, to leave something for him. What do you think? You think yes, you think not? Yeah? I'm most pleased that the Ukrainian Jewish encounter is honoring the memory of Metropolitan Andrei Sheptitsky and his role in saving Jews during World War II. By honoring his memory, we are also honoring the Uniate Church, which he headed, and the Brazilian Brothers of the Studite Order. We are especially honoring the memories of the Metropolitan's brother, St. Clemente, of Dr. Gabriel Kostelnik, of Sister Josefa, of Brat Marco Steck, of Brat Daniel Temchina, and many others to me unknown by name, who in a world gone mad had the courage to answer the ancient biblical question, Hashomer Achi Anochi, am I my brother's keeper, in the affirmative. It took the cooperative involvement of a large number of people who risked their lives to save Jews in those days. It is a fact that despite the involvement of so many people, there was not a single case where the presence of Jews was betrayed. How many Jews did they save? Historians tell us that the number was between 150 and 200. But the Talmud tells us that the saving of a single life is equivalent to the saving of a whole world. I would amend that. The saving of a single life is equivalent to saving many worlds. By saving the life of a seven-year-old boy, they saved my three children, my seven grandchildren, and an unknown number of worlds yet to come. It pains me that my people have not yet seen fit to honor Archbishop Sheptitsky. That in no way detracts from his honor, it detracts from ours.